Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Jake Poor, President and Chief Experience Officer of Integrated Loyalty Systems. Jake and his team consult with healthcare organizations around the country on how to improve the patient experience. Jake draws on some 20 years of experience with Disney to help healthcare organizations improve how they care for patients. In this podcast, we talk about Jake's career at Disney, then what it was like breaking out on his own and founding Integrated Loyalty Systems. We also talk about his recently published book, 99 Lessons Learned from Disney to Improve the Patient Experience, which I would recommend to anyone who is thinking about ways to improve the patient experience. The full-length interview runs about 90 minutes. I've produced an abridged version that runs about an hour. This is the full-length version. If you'd like to listen to the abridged version, please see our website, healthleaderforge.org, for the link. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening, and here is Jake Poor. Welcome to the podcast, Jake. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. So what drew you to Disney? How did you wind up at such an interesting company? (laughs) Well, I think it was climate. It was January of 1981. I was in my second year of college, literally shoveled my way out of the driveway in upstate New York, up in Rochester, New York, what we kindly refer to as rotten Chester, New York. The snowplow had just replowed me back in. I shoveled my way out the second time. I went to school at RIT up in Rochester, New York, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. And there was a sign in the commons where I was getting my coffee that says co-op Orlando, Florida. And I'm like, I'm going to that. But 400 people showed up and You know, I was a B student, I was an A plus student, and I'm like, oh, I'm never going to get this co-op because if they look at my grades, I'm, I'm, I'm shot. But I interviewed, and I got a call back and found out it was the Disney organization in Orlando, sunny Florida, and it was a three month work co-op in the marketing department. I'm like, sign me up. So that's that's how I started my my Disney career, just starting my junior year of college. All right, so so you went down to Disney, you're working in marketing. And that led to a pretty lengthy relationship with the organization. Yeah. Uh, So when did you start full-time with them? Well, that's another great story, Mark. Uh, We only had one theme park back then. It was called the Magic Kingdom. And the the college program was called the Magic Kingdom College Program because that's all there was at that time. While I was there in my three months, Epcot opened. But the interesting thing, I think, for your students in healthcare administration is the blessing for me is someone who didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Did I want to work with my uncle in the marketing department at Eastman Kodak? Well, I'm glad I didn't follow that career. Did I want to be a chain smoking director and producer at CBS like my dad? Did I want to be a thankless nurse manager in a state run institution like my mom? So I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to Disney university one day a week and I got three hour lectures from vice presidents of different divisions at Disney. Now, divisions that most people would think would be normal, you know, hotel management, food and beverage. But also, I learned that Disney had its own wastewater treatment plant. I guess that Disney doo-doo's got to go somewhere. (laughs) They had their own telephone company, Energy Plant, was sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy, which is now defunct. Disney was really a community of tomorrow that Walt's dream was coming true. It was 43 square miles of property, and they had only developed about 10 to 15% of the property at that time, but lectures for three hours on the science of Disney, the science of running not just a company, but a city. And I was like fascinated. And I, you know, not that I didn't pay attention in class in school, but when you don't really know what your mission is yet, you're not really paying attention the way you should. And there I was. And then (laughs) <laughs> Three days a week, they put me in merchandise on Main Street selling balloons. Boy, were my parents proud. We spent all this money on your education and you're doing what? Making $3.81 an hour selling balloons? Jeez, yeah. Jake, did you know our last name was poor? Come on now. <laughs> but I, I convinced them, listen, mom, one day a week I'm working in the marketing department, even though back then I was just stuffing envelopes and calling magazines for ads. But, but I was learning a science and I didn't really realize at that moment. Now, in January, when we all graduated from the Disney College program, we all went back to school. I signed up for classes, RIT, 
and MCC, a community college as well. And I bought my books back then. We bought books, right? Which cost a boatload of money. And then I got a phone call. Hey, Jake, we're opening up this new pavilion at Epcot called CommuniCore West. It's an information center. It's called Epcot Outreach and a Teacher Center. We'd love for you to work there. And I said, hey, I just bought all my books. I just got all my school. They go, listen, we'll reimburse you. We'll fly you back, but we want you to work in this research facility called Epcot Outreach. Anybody who has any question about anything Disney or growing of plants, hydroponically, uh, the list of the scenes in the French film, uh, learning about the Disney science, we want you to do research. We're going to give you an account with Nexus Lexus Computer, and we're going to start a, a living library of Disney archives, and you and your team of 12 folks are going to help run it. And to prepare me, and I accepted, of course, uh, uh, and they said, and, and we'll pay for your education. We'll reimburse you. You can go to school at the University of Central Florida, Valencia Community College, even Disney University. We have an, a really great academic uh, center here at Disney where you can get a lot of those lectures. So I was enticed for eight years. I worked at Epcot Outreach and was immersed in the art and science of Disney. All the research I did generated buying of real estate companies, television stations. It wasn't just for Disney World. It was for the new CEO and president, Frank Wells and Michael Eisner, where they could ex help expand the company. So that just gives you an idea of how I started my career. And really, January of 83 was, was this, this junior in college who didn't know what he wanted to do, but was immersed in an epicenter of information and, and trying to digest that information gave me a real Disney career. So, I mean, that sounds exciting. What was it that, you know, really... I mean, aside from the fact that it's Disney and that's, the, you know, the brand is, was even back in the early 80s was pretty, pretty well known. Um, you know, what was it about that opportunity that really drew you down there and said you had to, you had to go? Well, you know, with, with a family of six brothers and sisters and a grandmother who lived in our house, you got 10 people. When we go on vacation, we don't stay in hotels. We stayed in campgrounds. To go to Disney was a big deal. To get yeah. that amount of people, it was expensive, even back then, to get a family. But when we went to Disney... It was magical. And to be immersed on the Disney College program in peeling back that curtain and having you understand the business behind the magic really enticed me. And then I said, gosh, I, I really, don't, really don't know what my niche is yet. Maybe I'll use Disney to build my education, build, use Disney to build my resume. So, hey, I'll just stick around for a year or two. And all of a sudden, five years in, I'm opening up Pleasure Island. I'm launching new hotels for Disney. I'm doing research at Epcot Outreach about Tokyo Disneyland, and then we build the place. Or competing, where, where should we build our next theme park, Jake? Spain, Madrid, Spain, or Paris, France? And doing that demographic research and presenting to the company, and then they make an announcement. That was pretty cool. I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. But, and then working at Disney University and auditioning for the right to teach other new employees or cast members, we call them, yeah. what was the Disney culture? I was getting the bug. I was getting not just the education bug of, of, of soaking up all this science and art, but also the teaching bug. I'm like, this, I think I found what I really want to do in life. So this is so this sounds like a kind of a foreshadowing of of your your role as a consultant and working with uh, and teaching. So tell me, you know, tell me, a, a, you you started in research. You had a number of different jobs uh, at Disney, kind of your first time, you know, your first half of your career. Yeah. So kind of give me the arc of that that first exposure. My first twelve years, I, I like to tell people I had ten two year careers, even though that math doesn't add up. Um, I started out on the Disney College program in, in merchandise, but I, I went to Disney University, went into research and development and a teacher center, a VIP lounge for teachers on vacation to give them lesson plans so they could teach Disney Epcot concepts when they went back. I then, while working there, I was working side by side with Disney University to really hone the DNA of Disney. They would come and do research on themselves right. and, and helping them put together curriculum they would go, why don't you come over and help teach it? You know more about this than anybody. I go, oh, I'm not a teacher. I couldn't do that. I'm not that smart. And they go, well, you're a great storyteller. Why don't you come over? We're a culture of storytellers. So I would come over and be a guest speaker in three different workshops. And then one day somebody called in sick and they said, we got 12 lawyers showing up for $3,000 a piece to teach a, a four hour workshop. You know how to do it. Why don't you just do it? And I go, oh, okay. And I told the lawyers, I said, listen, this is on the house. If you don't love it, I've never done this before, but let's wing it. And I took them on a property tour. I took them in, you know, in didactic. And I really got the bug. 
I also worked in public relations, community relations, and special events. So any new opening of anything new, the Epcot Living Seas Pavilion, the largest aquarium in the world, the, the um, Norway Pavilion, uh, opening up at the Dolphin and Swan Hotel, Pleasure Island, first time Disney was doing nighttime entertainment, you know, going over to Paris and starting that project for D Euro Disneyland, which was called then, or Disneyland Paris, working on that whole corporate university. How would we make sure that we hire the right fit people, reward them and recognition and accountability. So I was really getting on the job training for organizational development and change because every time we did it in Tokyo, Paris, in Florida, it wasn't like we just took the Disneyland approach from 1955 that Walt started and dropped it into Florida. It was Disneyland was 212 acres. Walt Disney World was 28,000 acres. So how do we build the infrastructure or scaffolding around this nebulous thing called the Disney culture to make sure that we had consistency and continuity, not just replicating a, a Magic Kingdom type product. And, and so I really was hungry. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm with the company five years, getting a five-year pin. Next thing you know, I've got a 10-year pin. I'm like, what am I doing? All my friends are, are, are working for P, PwC and all these other companies, and they're making a bazillion dollars. Um, and, and, and I wasn't not making a bazillion dollars, but I also um, wasn't making uh, what I thought was equitable. So I thought it was time, time to leave after 12 years. And I, I got a phone call from some headhunters to work for Franklin Covey a time yeah. management company and, and they were merging Franklin quest, the time management and okay. Stephen Covey, the seven habits. And that was a, another great little two year stint that I did. Yeah. So, so before we, I, I want to ask you a little bit about that. Um, sure. but, uh, so it sounds like you moved from research uh, to, you had a role in teaching, but you were also doing operations work. How did, how did, yeah. is that correct? Yes. The great thing about working at Disney, it doesn't matter what your degrees in, doesn't matter how much experience you have. You have to have education and you have to have experience. It, it greases the skids to get any promotion within the organization. But what they want is a well-rounded experience. So get your education, get some preliminary experience so you, so you have some credibility and street cred, but then they move you around. And very much like the military, right? Every two years they move commanders around, which is a whole nother cultural uh, uh, conversation for another time. But I went into operations for a small stint. I'm like, well, okay, this is not for me per se, but I got my, I got my skin, uh, my, my street stripes. I then went into research and development for marketing and international marketing. I then went into, um, I went over to University of Geneva for a year to learn French and international business. I worked in the Paris project, building Disney University, Euro Disneyland, uh, so that when we opened that park with those new 1,500 employees, they understood the Disney way, but have applied it to the French or European community way. I then came back and launched Disney Vacation Club, which is, which is a whole idea of how do we reverse this negative stereotype about timeshare where they lock you into the same week every year, they do pressure sales, they separate you and your wife into different rooms, and they, they shame you into buying a timeshare. And we wanted to remove all that stereotype, but we wanted to give people an opportunity to own a piece of Disney's magic. And so a lot of new businesses, nighttime entertainment, as I told you before. And it's not that I wasn't, uh, it's not that I was bored, but when you stay with an organization like this for long enough with, with education and experience, you get promoted from within. Yeah. Can we just tell me a little bit about launching um, the Disney brand in France? I mean, so it sounds mm -hmm. like you went, you, they sent you for training and for a year of training before, mm -hmm. Um, what was that like trying to, trying to find a way to, cause I remember that hearing about that and kind of, you know, the French have some reservations about an American, you know, a cultural icon from America coming over to, to France. So what was it like trying to make that all work and retain both? It sounds like you were trying to have something French and, but also retain the Disney culture. What was that like trying to do that? Well, that's. That's another podcast for another time we could do, but let me, let me give you the Cliff Notes version. Tokyo was a, was a, a, a co-developed project with Oriental Land Company, which is a real estate holding company, and they found the best of the best. They handpicked the best of the best to work in that park. The people in Japan were very used to standing in lines in the subways and so on. So getting them to, and they wanted everything in English, even though we would close caption everything in Japanese. On the, outs, uh, on the outset, in comparing uh, France to Spain, 
it actually made sense, more sense to build in Madrid because it was warmer climate. They were a more relaxed culture. But the organization as it is, look, took our research and said, we're going to, we have all these incentives from the president of France. Uh, we're going to have a TGV bullet train to the front door. They're going to give us all these highways to get us there. It's central Europe more than Madrid. There was a lot of reasons they chose Paris. However, Paris, like any big city, New York City, LA, is a city. And, and, I don't, and I've lived in France uh, on and off for two years. Uh, it's not necessarily a reflection of the entire country. It's a big city. Everything is fast. If you don't know it, very fast. And if you don't know French, they're kind of rude. And so we were very concerned by hiring just Parisians, but we were only 20 miles uh, east of, of the city. And we had to hire only French at that time. The European community was coming together, but it hadn't come together yet. And it was very difficult. Uh, the Communist Party egged our CEO on the Champs-Élysées. <laughs> um, um, we had unions to deal with. By the way, Disney in Orlando, we had 24 unions, 17 bargaining agreements. Um, a lot of people think, oh, unions, how did you get anything done? It wasn't an adversarial relationship for us because we had clearly defined the culture with the unions about what we stood for, what we would stand. However, the unions in Paris, uh, you know, the characters uh, would do strikes. And so we had some rough starts. We also build too much too fast. Too many hotels, hired too much staff, and we couldn't, nobody wanted to stay at our hotels when you could stay 20 miles in Paris. However, they made some strategic changes. They made some cost reductions like we all have to do in a for-profit situation, which we were. And the park, I'm happy to say, changed its name from Euro Disneyland to Disneyland Paris, to use that moniker of Paris as a draw. And it is a very successful organization today, and not to discredit anybody French, but I think partly because the European community came in and we got to hire people from Belgium, from the Netherlands, from Germany, and we got to be more selective of the people we hired, not just because they were French, we had to hire you, but we hired the right fit talent for the right role, which was the Disney way to begin with. So you, you mentioned you jumped... Uh, for a couple of years over to Franklin Covey, which is also a kind of a iconic name out of the kind of the nineties. Um, you know, everybody had the, the Covey planner and all, all that kind of stuff. Back yeah. back day. Um, so you, you said you made that jump maybe because you'd been there, you were looking for something a little different to do. So what did you learn in the, in the couple of years you were at uh, Franklin Covey? That's a great question. First of all, I, I learned I had a passion for healthcare. Uh, let me take you back a second. I was a Franklin Flexible Trainer, FFT. Uh, when I launched, helped launch Disney's version of Timeshare, my CEO at the time of that division of Disney, Disney Vacation Club said, hey, our people need a tool. They need to be more organized. They need to stay on schedule. They need to keep their promises. Why don't you go get trained? I went to Tampa, got trained to be a trainer of Franklin Covey Time Management Seminar. And I came back and be a trainer. And I really got the Franklin bug. It's really a way to organize your life, not just your day. And one of my things that I did then is I was curious about, I had hit that little bit of a glass ceiling at Disney promotion wise. I hadn't finished my degree. It keeps sending me on all these projects around the world. And once you don't hit that four year degree, man, you're not going any further. So I knew I had to go back to school and I wanted Disney to pay for it. The other thing is Franklin was calling me and say, listen, you're one of the highest rated facilitators we have. Uh, at Disney, there's seven of you, but you're high. Can you come work for us? We're growing exponentially. We're merging with Franklin Quest and Shipley Associates, and you can pick any state in the union. And I said, oh, wow, I'm from a big family. I wouldn't mind moving back to upstate New York and connect with my family. And my mom was a nurse in a state-run institution. She couldn't promote the good people. She couldn't get rid of the bad people. I said, I'd really love to have some of our workshops, stress management, project management, and time management for my mom and her hospital in upstate New York. And that, I took the job. I got to move my hometown. I got to reconnect with my six brothers and sisters and five nieces and nephews and also help my mom through a life ending illness of lung cancer and also made it a better place to work. So I started to specialize, this is where I got the healthcare bug, in hospitals in upstate New York. So I had all of upstate New York from Buffalo over to Albany down to New York City. I really got the bug. And, and then Stephen Covey came aboard with the seven habits of highly uh, uh, effective people. And I said, gosh, this is really good stuff. Even Disney could use it. And then what happened was I got a phone call from Bob Reed, who is the head of business development at Disney University. He said, hey, we're starting to form this relationship with Stephen Covey. Can you help? You've worked at both companies. They wrote this book, The, the Stuff Americans Are Made Of. 
we'd like to, we're launching this new thing called the Disney Institute. Maybe you can help build a bridge. Well, he was secretly recruiting me and I was building this bridge. And then I came back to Orlando after this meeting and they offered me, hey, why don't you help us launch the Disney Institute where we're now going to share our blueprints with the world. Who better to lead that than somebody who, who understands both sides of the coin? So that's how I came back. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of your questions. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. Uh, so how, how did, um, how was the Disney Institute different from, because you had mentioned Disney University. Mm -hmm. How was Disney Institute different from Disney University? Well, back in 1986, I was teaching new employee orientation, which Disney calls Disney traditions. Traditions one is for every employee. Traditions two is for leadership and so on. And the book In Search of Excellence came out by, by um, Tom Peters and I can't remember the other guy's name, Weiss. Anyway. Tom Peters wrote a book in search of excellence and chapter three or four was about Disney university and how you have to create a corporate university. Well, every CEO in the nation wanted to come see Disney university and sit in our new employer orientation class. Exxon was uh, the CEO of Exxon came and finally we we're like, listen, you're, you're, you're inhibiting our ability to teach by putting strangers in the back of the room. So we created a classroom across the hall and charged them a boatload of money and taught them why we taught it. This genesis over the next 10 or 11 years. Um, so in 1996, they said, why don't we create a whole corporate university where we sell our secrets to the world? So it'll be two or three hours of didactic. Here's our science behind selection, onboarding, uh, care, and uniforms and name tags. Now let's go out and see it in action. And so it was experiential. And I was all about experiential and growing up at Disney, two things that Disney leadership really honed in on which was the power of storytelling and inspiration to drive that perspiration which is operations and the other thing was the ability to build it into departmental playbooks not just philosophic mission vision and values nothing wrong with mission and vision and values but what does it look like in work clothes what does it sound like when we answer the phone and so disney institute was the way now that we could take disney university our internal culture how do we onboard how do we teach cooking classes and how to fold towels into origami animals for housekeepers. So the business of Disney was taught in Disney University, how you onboard and train. But Disney Institute now was our ability to sell strangers the way Disney's blueprints could be adapted and adopted to banking, airlines, hospitals. So how, what was your role uh, in, the, in, in the time you were with Disney Institute? Because that was about five years, I think. Yes, six, six years. So I, I left, so I, I was with Disney 12 years. I left for two years and I came back for another six years. And I said, the quid pro quo is when I come back, I'll help you launch the Disney Institute. I was a, a sales, senior sales manager is what they called me. I said, but I want to start the healthcare division. They go, healthcare division? We just want to get this thing up and running. I said, when we get it up and running, I want to run healthcare. I want to, I want to change the face of healthcare. And they, ooh, we like that. Change the face of healthcare. But okay. we're Disney. Uh, so, you know, you get us up and running. So the quid pro quo was I'll get us up and running. And I got about 80% of the revenue generated the Disney Institute. I think it was about $20, $30 million first couple of years. And 80% of that came from healthcare. And they're like, ooh, you're onto something. So they started yeah. giving me some resources, some facilitators who we could customize. We actually brought in Fred Lee, a, a, an executive at Florida Hospital to help us customize our curriculum for our leadership program, the Disney approach to leadership excellence. And then he went out and wrote a book at Disney ran your hospital. I'm like, uh, darn it. He beat me to the punch. Uh, <laughs> great. A great guy. Unfortunately, recently passed away a couple of years ago uh, with a brain tumor. But what he did was exactly what I was trying to do over my six years. Yes. We'll customize it to blockbuster and BMW and PWC and, and all those other companies. But what my passion was is how do we customize it to an industry that I believe was 20 to 30, 30 years behind hospitality? How do we name our conference rooms? How do we wear our name tags where they don't flip over? I mean, if you just take the science of Disney cookie cutter and apply it to healthcare, juxtapose their, their light years apart. And, and, and so I'm like, I was getting this bug. And, and healthcare were hungry. They were looking at companies that were world-class and consistent, like organizations that had created consistency and continuity worldwide, but nobody was selling their blueprints. A airlines were keeping it to themselves. Automobile industries were keeping it to themselves. But Disney's now going, we'll share it with you. So yeah. I got the healthcare bug, basically. So uh, that's a, an interesting point. Why would Disney share their 
knowledge. Like that, that was, that's hard won, you know, uh, hard earned uh, uh, knowledge. Why would Disney do that when all these other companies are like, yeah, we're not, we're not sharing what we do. We, we may do it well. Um, I don't mean to be coarse, but why does Disney have a gift shop after every attraction? People buy an emotion, right? Uh, why do we sell merchandise that say I survived the Tower of Terror and I'll never ride it again? Because it's a merchant, it's a for-profit organization. Now, there is a mission to create happiness for every person, every Disney, we create happiness by providing the finest and entertainment for people of all ages everywhere. That's our mission, right? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, we had to generate 20% return, 20% growth, and 20% return on stockholder value. We were a for-profit organization, and all of us had budgets to adhere to. I Listen, we, Disney didn't sell its secrets because they're nice people and they want to share it with the world. At the right. end of the day, I think they wanted to, to generate revenue. Somebody smart probably Valerie Oberly or some of my old bosses said, gosh, you know, we get a lot of requests for executives wanting to pay whatever money they want to learn our secrets. Why don't we just create a for-profit arm of the company called Seminar Productions, which later became Disney Institute and make that a profit center. We also had a new CEO, Michael Eisner and his wife, uh, Jane Eisner, grew up at Chautauqua, which is a community in Jamestown, New York, where people come for the summer with whole families and she wanted to replicate that at Disney. And so we took an old resort that it kind of had been dusted called the Disney Village Resort, renamed it Disney Institute, build an amphitheater, uh, build a uh, performance arts. We brought in James Earl Jones and a lot of famous speakers like the mayor of New York. And we gave lectures. We wanted whole families to stay together. The original idea wasn't a business center. The whole idea was to create another niche within Disney where whole families could come together, experience rock climbing for the kids, and mom and dad could take business seminars. Okay. But I think at the end of the day, let's be honest. I think it's because of money. Yeah. Sure. But McDonald's wants to make money. You know, the airlines want to make money. I mean, like, so I guess that's my, that's my, really my question is sure. Every, the, all those big businesses want to make money. Why is it McDonald's? Why doesn't McDonald's? Because they have something like, they have a corporate yeah, training. Right? They do. So pretty well known. Uh, but it's not open to any, like, as far as I know, like you can't yeah. go like, Hey, I'll take a seminar on, you know, how to manage how to, how to, you know, sustain quality across hundreds of a hundred thousand locations or whatever it's the crazy number it is they have across all different cultures. And so that, I, I just thought, well, it's interesting. Like what would the, obviously it's profit, right? But, you know. I think, you know, Mark, I think the hook and a lot of us as we are entrepreneurs, we, we're like a hook. Well, maybe we should create this product to go with our seminar. I think the hook was we want to make more money. But it's a value. But it's a value add. I think the hook is okay to say we're going to generate more revenue, right? Yeah. But what we found is the hook led to something bigger and better than all of us. It made us better. At the beginning of Sunday night, when we launched our our three and a half day program, we said, "Good, good evening. Welcome to the Disney Institute. My name is. We're going to talk about over the next three days the Disney approach. Here are four day passes." Now go out and see if we're doing it. Before we tell you anything, we'll see you tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning was my worst day of the week. Monday morning, I'd come into that classroom with 60 people and we had magic moments that were shared and we had what we call tragic moments that were shared. And we basically said, you see, we're not perfect. Uh, the Disney Magic has over 100,000 employees now with 24 unions, 17 bargaining agreements, 35,000 contracted employees who you think work for us the people pe people who take your picture in front of the castle or epcot ball or tree of life they don't work for us anymore we've outsourced that you don't need to know that but now let's peel the curtain behind this magic and have you understand the mechanisms we put in place to share how we try to get to that level of constancy and consistency and yeah. and, and it made us better mark it made disney university better it made us better because we had instant feedback instant return which healthcare is lagging yeah. So you said you developed a passion for healthcare while you were with, with uh, uh, Franklin Covey. Um, and then you brought that back to, to Disney. So what was it you had to offer healthcare? Because you weren't, you came out of Disney, you were doing the Franklin Covey. So it's not, so I don't mean to minimize this, but like you were, you weren't a healthcare administrator. So for example, so what did you see as an outsider, if you will, from the industry that allowed you to contribute to the industry in a meaningful way? It's a, it's a great question. So 
I found this guy, Dr. Brian Wong, who is a, a physician, practicing physician in Seattle. He also worked with Anderson Consulting. And I brought him in. He and I worked on a project at the University of Colorado together. The Disney Institute now was not just bringing people to Disney and show them the science of Disney. We'd actually take them back to their hospital and help them change their processes, their hiring, their training. And I created a whole underground consulting firm within Disney uh, to do that. But I, I didn't know healthcare. I didn't know DRGs from FTEs and RVUs. I didn't know all the ins and outs in the, in the barriers and bureaucracy that I, that I know today. So I brought experts in. Deloitte and Touche, who I partnered with, Arthur Anderson, I partnered with. And I found this guy, Dr. Brian Wong, and he really gave me insights on the fiefdoms and silos. And, 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 I, and I said, well, listen, we have fiefdoms and silos at Disney too. We don't brag about it. But here's how we cut through the morass of the bureaucracy and, and, and the politics by here are some hooks. And I would share those hooks with him and he goes, oh my gosh, you have no idea. Your science could be directly applied to healthcare. So he and I partnered on hours, off hours, and we worked, we, we spoke at probably 30 of the 50 hospital associations. As a matter of fact, when, when 9-11 happened, I left the New Hampshire Hospital Association, flew to Boston, Boston, LA, LA to Palm Springs, and I was at Eisenhower Medical Center doing a cultural assessment with Dr. Wong when the second plane hit the Twin Towers. And I said, geez, not only do we have a science here that healthcare needs, some very common sense things, some very back to basic things we should have learned by our parents, our grandparents, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. But what I learned is not everybody was a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. Not everybody grew up in my house. Now, not everybody went to a Lutheran church on Sunday uh, uh, in, in Rochester, New York. So, he helped me understand that there were some major gaps, not only between hospitals, and every hospital is unique, but even within hospitals, there were fiefdoms and contracts and hospitalists and ED docs and you know, residents and academia. Oh, it was so much. But I, I saw a template start to arise. Common sense things about not keeping the patient in the loop, not sharing wait times with them. Um, and, and, and he and I decided, and, and, and by the way, the, the art, uh, of medicine, you know, not putting a, an eighth grade clock in the exam room above the exam table. So that's the only thing you have to watch while your daughter's sitting there re writhing on the table for three hours. I mean, these were very some common sense things. So he and I started to build these blueprints by taking the template of Disney and customizing it to healthcare. And, and again, with Fred Lee's help too at Florida Hospital, um, and Fred wrote the book if Disney ran your hospital. So I, I have to give him credit. But Brian and I, Dr. Wong and I, said, how do, we, how do we reverse engineer this through medical schools, through residency, through onboarding, through pay, not just relative value units, but holding people accountable to patient satisfaction and employee morale, not just productivity relative value units. So I started to see the Disney template come alive. Now, did I have credibility as a non-healthcare executive when I first left Disney and started to talk about this? No, but they, what they couldn't take away takeaway was the art and science that I've learned that made yeah. Disney successful. And they started to, and by giving them a lot of examples, they said, oh, I can see how this might apply to my hospital. Well, not only people would come up to me afterwards, Mark, and go, I see how this applies to my marriage. I see how this applies to my raising of kids. No kidding. Yeah, we raise, we raise our team like we raise our family. So yeah. I'm sorry, I'm babbling. No, no that's great. Um, I mean, uh, your, the point, I think, in part that you make is, you know, uh, establishing that credibility and that was one of the questions i want to ask you you know was how, how do you you know as a person as a kind of an outsider i mean you've been doing it for a long time so now yeah. you're not right now. yeah yeah but at the at, you know at the beginning that must have been a challenge to, to navigate all the like i didn't realize that the, the urologist doesn't talk to the you know whoever because that's the you know you're right. talking about the silos and, yeah so you you actually founded integrated loyalty systems in 2001 and, and yeah. Um, around the time you were talking about the, uh, you know, uh, September 11th. Um, I mean, it seemed like you, it sounds like you had this great career going at Disney. Um, you know, it's a big organization. So we were just talking about this before we got podcast started, you know, uh, not a lot of people have the confidence to make the jump to start their own business. I mean, entrepreneurship is, 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 is not a common thing. And, and, and for somebody to survive as long as you have uh, in the field is, is, so what was it that you said to yourself, I think I could do this on my own. I don't, I don't need 
the Disney brand, which is an enormous, like, that's a, that's a <laughs> huge thing. Just like, I'm, I can do this all on my own. What was it that gave you the confidence to do that? A really smart wife. Yeah, all right. My wife uh, was a director of marketing and international marketing at Disney. We had great benefits. She had a good paycheck. And she said, Jake, I love you, but I never see you. You work 20 hour days. You love and live this thing you're doing in healthcare. Why don't you at least do it on your own? You know, you're making good money, but if you really want to change the face of healthcare, why don't you and Brian do it? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, you know, the big brother takes care of me. We got right. this house and this car. And she's like, yeah, but you know what? I never see you anyway. So at least if you're going to work 20 hour days, don't you think you should do it for us? And we had a little bit of a crutch because I had her. I didn't have any kids yet. We have three now, but I had a really smart wife who kicked me out of the nest. Okay. Compounding this was I'm flying back and forth to Rochester and my mom is going through lung cancer, uh, 32 oncology treatments. We're sitting in the waiting area, Mark, of the ontology, hematology waiting area. And my wife, my, my mom, Barb, leans over to me and she elbows me like she did a lot when I was a kid. She goes, look at that. I look above the nurse's station. She goes, jeez. What above the nurse station were two baskets of plants. They were just dead stems. And she leans in. She goes, geez, if they can't take care of the plants, <clears throat> just saying, right? They're not going to take care of me. I take my grandmother to the eye doctor or to eye surgery. She had cataract surgery in that same hospital. We went to the cafeteria because we got to the hospital three hours early. That's what grandmothers do, right? So I take her to the cafeteria. Let's eat something. We went through four dirty forks before we found a clean fork. We went through four dirty trays before she went and found a clean tray. My grandmother knows cleanliness. And then she says to me, I hope somebody's cleaning the surgical instruments. At Disney, we had a phrase, everything speaks. Everything matters in your guest experience, just like everything matters in the patient experience. Who's watering the plants? Who's cleaning the forks and trays? So I, I saw this parallel start to come together. I go, gosh, what I do is common sense, but it's not common practice in healthcare, while everybody's working with doctors and nurses at bedside, who's working with dietary? The person running the register, the person watering the doggone plants because it's sending unintended messages. So parallel to this, I got a wife who's smart and trying to kick me out of the nest to take the Disney blueprints and customize. I got a physician partner who's trying to pull me out and say, we can do this. And then I've got a family who's dealing with, oh, I don't know, customer service that's 30 years behind in healthcare. The need was there. The hunger was there. The expertise was there. I just needed to make the step. So was it just you when you started out or did you partner with Dr. Wong? No. Uh, okay. uh, three of us got together in a higher regency in Lake Buena Vista. We got a little suite. We pulled our money together and we sat in a suite for three days until we cranked out a business plan. Uh, Mark Bachman was the chief financial officer of our company. He used to work for Children's Hospital in Atlanta. Dr. Wong worked for a hospital in Seattle, and then I worked for Disney. So I knew I didn't know finance. That's why I married as a certified financial planner. <laughs> I knew I didn't know medicine, so I found the best doctor I knew. And so the three of us, we figured we had a three-legged stool. So we cranked out a business plan, and we made some phone calls. I called Ed Eckenhoff, the CEO of National Rehab Hospital, who brought his entire executive team to the Disney Institute a few years before. I said, Ed, I couldn't help you then, but I can help you now. What have you done with the blueprints we helped you develop? He goes, not a lot. I said, how would you like to hire me and Brian and, Do and, and Mark Bachman to come help you? 30,000 bucks for six months of work. How about that? He goes, wow, what a deal. W where do I sign? I go, all right, you sign. So we had a deal. We had a contract. And I blew up my credit cards in the first three weeks. And I'm like, oh, man. So we did a cultural assessment. We started building the blueprints. We started building an internal corporate university. We built new employee orientation. I was doing 90% of the work. And Mark and Brian were like, let us know when you need help. And I was splitting the money three ways. And I ended up driving. Everybody will give you a gas car back in, the, back in the 2001. So I drove back and forth between D.C. and Orlando for six months. I had an office on the third floor inpatient unit smell of urine in the morning. It was like napalm, you know, um, but we did it. We were successful. I stayed in the Disney closet. I didn't tell a bunch of Disney stories. I didn't use the Disney way. I helped them build their own unique culture from within. And we knew it. Okay. We, now we have a template. Now we have street cred and they're part of a huge health system called MedStar Health. So we went across the street. 
We work for Washington Hospital Center, Good Samaritan. All of a sudden, we had a whole niche. All 1,200 nurses, the Visiting Nurses Association, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, wanted to work with us. All of a sudden, we had a grassroots organization starting, and we just started, and that's what's great about healthcare. Everybody knows everybody, right. and everybody's willing to share their, their blueprints with the world as long as you're not another hospital within 60 miles of my hospital. I'll share them with you. And guess what else to your listeners? Everybody moves. So don't ever piss anybody off because you may end up reworking or interviewing with them later down the road. So the head of uh, patient experience then went to Sharp Healthcare in San Diego. We started working the Sharp experience and so on and so forth. Kaiser Permanente, they all move around. And so my company by word of mouth grew with no marketing budget at all. That's, that's pretty amazing. So you were delivering the things that we, you know, we need in healthcare. I had a similar, I mean, I, I have to say, so I, I think when we met at ACHE, you know, last uh, uh, spring, or I guess it was this spring, right? We're still in spring. Um, right. uh, you know, I, I told you, I, I served in the, in the Army Medical Service Corps for, you know, 20 odd years. And I just, you know, I have, I remember, you know, reading your book. So we're going to talk about the book here in a second, but like reading your book, I remember uh, my first assignment as a practice manager, the, the medics would come out into the waiting room and shout out, not just, not your name, but your last four of your social security numbers. So you were, you were, <laughs> you were a number, you know? Yeah. I remember sitting in on a conversation uh, much later, like around the time you started, you started like in like 2001. And this, it just feels like, you know, like you said, 30 years behind. I remember sitting in a, in a, in a budget meeting with the CIO talking about, you know, questioning whether we needed to have phones in each patient room. Was that really, that's kind of an extravagance to have a phone in, in each patient room. Like, and this was 2001. So I, uh, and I think in, in the 10 years after, 10, 15 years after that, that I served, I saw a, a significant change in the way that we do do that. But, you know, I think it's, it's true. Like a lot of this, uh, you know, my experience um, is healthcare could learn a lot from, from some of the, you know, some of the, the lessons that you've learned at Disney and share. So you've been doing this now for, for 18 years successfully. That's, that's yeah. all. And you've recently written a book, so, and uh, that draws on the lessons about culture and customer service that you learned in the time you worked at Disney. And so let me just kind of speechify here for a second. Uh, so your book is called 99 Lessons Learned from Disney to Improve the Patient Experience. And I, I read the book and, and found it really interesting because pretty much everybody can relate to Disney. I mean, almost everybody's been there. And, and, and the company, you know, as we've been talking about, sets a really high bar for customer experience. I really liked the book. I thought it was an interesting mix of uh, both kind of specific techniques and then kind of broader strategies or approaches to culture. So congratulations on, on getting that out. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. And, I, and, <laughs> and getting and my I, wife off my back. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's 99 lessons. So we, we're not going to have time to talk about all of them, obviously, but I thought it, right. I picked out a couple that I wanted to, um, I, I, that I thought were interesting and, and wanted to ask you about. But let me, well, let me, before we get into that, like, what was it that made you decide to write the book? Again, a very smart wife. Um, she, I have three books in the works. This is uh, one of the three books. And she's like, listen, you've got 170 tips here that you've been sharing with healthcare. Why don't you just throw it in a book, call it 99 lessons and get done with it. I said, what do you need a book for? She goes, credibility. I said, I have it. I've been doing this for 18 years. She goes, new business. I got, I got plenty. We have a dozen employees and I, I don't have enough people to keep up with the demand. She goes, just finish the darn book. She said it in other words, but I'm like, fine. So she helped wordsmith it and so on. And, and basically, um, it's not the how-to book. It's tips. It's, 90, it's, just, it's, an, it's a coffee table thing you can put on your desk in your office and pick it up and just go to tip number 78, which is creating a waiting room, care, a care coordinator in the emergency room department. Somebody who just rounds on visitors in the waiting room, just keeping them in the loop. Patients don't mind waiting, but they hate being kept in the dark. Is this three hours? Is this three minutes? Is this going to be three days? Can I offer you some water? Can I give your daughter a magazine or a coloring book? Can I call somebody for you? Can I charge your phone? Oh, just common sense thing. Walking in the back and, and rounding on patients and visitors in the exam rooms. Can I, call, can I get to the doctor? I'll go check on that for you. Doctor, can I help you? Can you run down to radiology and find out the debate? an expediter, a, an information conduit, or somebody who just makes the comfortable, uh, uh, the, the weight a little bit more comfortable. You mentioned earlier 
coming out to the waiting area. Here we are, 2019. We're in June 2019, and we still walk out to the waiting area and go, Bonica, right. Bonica, Bueller, right? We're ready for your pep smear now, right? That's a hip infringement, for God's sake. And if you're in a, a, a mental health facility, your own facility, and you don't want anybody knowing you get a mental health exam, what if Disney ran your waiting area? Right? We would at least give you a vibrating pager and vibrate, and it would come up and say, Oh, and look at the pager number. You go, Mr. Uh, this is Dr. Bonica, right? Oh, call me Mark. Mark, it is. You, are you okay, Mark, if everybody calls you Mark? So we have to write down what you're wearing. We have to come out and say, You must be Mr. That would use the Apple Store does that. When you check in with your greeter at the Apple Store, they write down what you're wearing white guy, blue striped shirt, right? Uh, and slack, gray slacks. So the guru. The uh, Apple guru who comes out, the genius, they call him, walks right up to you. say, are you Mark? Uh, I am. I hear having trouble with your iPad. I am. But I, how did you know that was me? Oh, the person checked in. We have a little iPad app to put you, what you're wearing. Why don't we do that in healthcare? Why, yeah. why after a thousand years of medical discovery and, and changing of the, of the clinical pathway, do we still use the Department of Motor Vehicle way of waiting? Come on, think about it. At least the last hundred years, the moder- medicine changes we've made, but the waiting area hasn't changed at all. So I just, I just be myself. I'm like, gosh, if Disney ran this, we would do this. We'd at least try to entertain you while you wait and then try to sell you a t-shirt on the way out. Another <laughs> opportunity for healthcare. So, so we say these words on our website, privacy, compassion, dignity. You have them in words, but my job is to make them come to life in the emergency department. Our first impression is our last impression in a lot of organizations. And so these 99 lessons are, are just a way to trigger you. What I love about my job most, Mark, is I'm not that smart of a guy. I tell some stories, I give some tools, and I listen to you tell us, and I've just taken those adaptations of the Disney stories I told and given it back to you as a way to be a catalyst to keep the conversation going. That's all. I like the point that you make about like, and this is a thing I've, as a younger, you know, as a younger leader, and I was, you know, getting exposed to this idea of strategic statements, you know, mission, vision, values, everybody suddenly, you know, we were doing the balanced scorecard, and it was getting pushed down, and everybody had to have a mission, and, you know, great idea, um, and then you write something like, you know, uh, uh, compassion is our, you know, our value, and then how do you actually, op- yeah, great, write that down, but how do you operationalize that? Right. right. The other problem, and I had this conversation with one of your predecessors, General Horoho, who was the surgeon, uh, surgeon general. What's that? She was my boss. I worked for her once. Oh, yeah. Well, we sat down and she said, Jake, I love your blueprints. I was at uh, a press skating conference where she was at. She looked at my blueprints and how I help organizations make a culture transformation. She goes, that's great. But can we do this with 32 medical treatment facilities around the world at the same time? I said, no. I said, but we didn't, we didn't train 65,000 employees at Disney at the same time. We trained 6,500 leaders with the tools to start a conversation with those employees in 24 unions and 70 bar- bargaining agreements and got them to think it's their idea. The secret sauce is not to try to impose the Disney way or the Cleveland Clinic way or the Studer Group way. It's try to get the organization to build their own way, but it has to be intentional. Your greatest challenge, Mark, is when you left as a commander of a facility because now that leader's leadership is being replaced by a new leader who comes in with their own new way. Mm. Now, the, the army has a field manual. Uh, the Jews have the Torah and the Christians have the Bible. But what does it look like to each individual? We've got a bunch of silos. And man, we, we've got to get those silos together to say, all right, this is what we're going to stand for here. Here's what it's going to look like. We're going to create a culture with intention. And here's what we're not going to stand for. The things that we say, how do patients know we're short staffed? Because we tell them. We tell them because we don't want to be yelled at. Why am I late? Because we're short-staffed today. We've just created fear and anxiety and trepidation, which Florence Nightingale said over 165 years ago are the number one reasons patients have have anxiety because we give it to them, right? And so, (laughs) you know, part of my job is not to navel gaze and philosophize. Part of my job is to roll up my sleeves and get with the trade passers and sterile processing and connect them back to purpose. But they have to tell us what it looks like and sounds like. Otherwise, you're just another cashier running a register in a cafeteria. Or worse, the person running the grill in New Orleans goes, next, like the soup Nazi from Seinfeld, right? How is she allowed to do that? Because that's not our way. It's her way. And she's been here 20 years. She's been through seven CEOs, right? 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting on my soap. No, no, I, I, you know, that's my experience. I mean, uh, being in, and, and I feel bad for a lot of like the civilian employees who worked at like army medical centers where you'd have us, you know, a new commander would come in for two years right. and that person's trying to, you know, make his <clears throat> mark and comes up with a new program. Yeah. And then that person leaves and the next commander comes in with a new program and the next, and there's no consistency. And that's a problem that the military faces. And I, I don't think I'm telling stories out of turn, but that's a, that's a problem that because of the structure there, there's lots of great things about military medicine. Yeah. But that's one of the ones that's really annoying and, and, and turns people into skeptics, right? Because it's always that flavor of the day. Can I, can I jump in right there for a second? So what's happening in the last 200 years of medicine in America? Departmental chairs. Exact same thing happens. You weren't at a meeting. Guess what? You're now the dude departmental chair, Mark, for the next two years. Now, we don't know what your mission, vision, and values are. We don't know if your personal uh, attributes align with this faith-based organization or this milica- military treatment facility. Uh, we don't know. We don't care. You're just the administrator. We're going to give you enough RVUs to go to meetings for us so we don't have to go. So what's the accountability? What's the leadership? Where are we going? At best, you create a silo called Department of Cardiology. At worst, you're just an administrator just is on call if something goes wrong. And so that's been manifested over years. And, and that's the kind of the, the walls I'm trying to bring down. Yeah. Well, so we've been, we've been bouncing around a little bit about mission, vision, values. And, and that, you know, is one of my, just like I said, you know, I developed a lot of skepticism about that as a, you know, as a young leader. So that actually ties into lesson number 30 uh, from your, from your book, uh, you call it localize your culture. And I really like the examples you use from Disney. Um, uh, you said Disney's main mission statement is we create happiness by providing the finest in entertainment for people of all ages everywhere. And what I liked was how you gave examples of how different subordinate organizations kind of adopt that first part of the statement, the yeah. we create happiness. Talk about that a little bit. What is, how, how does that work? Well, in, in new employee orientation at Disney, which we call Disney traditions, we would ask uh, employees to understand where we're going. Okay, we get everybody to stand up in the room and I get them to close their eyes. I said, the good news is, the CFO of the company's bought a brand new Cadillac Escalade. It's 100 yards from here. I'd just like you to point which way it is. And everybody would point in different directions. Co- uncover your eyes. See where everybody's pointing. I said, are we ever going to be in the same direction? Will anybody get the keys to that car? And then I play Oprah. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. And they sit down. I said, the point of that exercise, pun intended, is everybody has their own definition of where we're going. Not in this organization. It's just three words. And this is, if you remember nothing else after eight hours of orientation, we create happiness. That's what we do. Now, you you said you're a lawyer. Great. You're going to legal department. You, you said you're going to work in the wastewater treatment plant. You're going to be a balloon seller on Main Street. You're going to be a singer and dancer and play a Disney character. Great. Well, it doesn't matter what you do. That's your task. That's your job task. Your new role is to create happiness. Keep us out of Disney court, but keep make sure you create happiness. And if you're not taking care of the customer, you're taking care of someone who is. Everybody has a role in this show. Now, when you get to your department tomorrow, you're going to get a departmental trainer you're going to be assigned to, doesn't matter what your role is, and they're going to localize it, whether you run the Celebration Health Florida Hospital in Celebration City here, or you work one of our seven clinics on property, one of our five or four fire departments, doesn't matter where you work or what you do, we all create happiness. And what's the most important word of those three? We create happiness. And they say, we, exactly. Doesn't matter what you do, what you, you know, if you don't pull the curtains, the show doesn't go. If you don't set up the microphone for that singer and dancer, the show doesn't go. If you don't clean that costume down in the basement or cut hair appropriately or shine shoes appropriately, the show doesn't go. Everybody is just as important as everybody else. And there's a huge distinction now in healthcare because if you work in sterile processing, putting together surgical equipment, but you have never seen that equipment in action, you don't have your role in the show. And after new employer orientation, Mark, or what I also like to refer to as the guest speaker death march of one speaker after another speaker that comes in and has no idea what the seven previous speakers said, if you are not connected to the mission of this organization, then we're lost. We're, as Yogi Bear likes to say, we're lost, but we're making great time, right? And that's healthcare to me. And that's what my mom used to admire around the fireplace when she would do her 12 or 24 hour shift. She'd sit by the fireplace with her glass of Chardonnay and she'd tell me about her day. And that's why I didn't go to nursing because nurses still eat their young and doctors treat nurses poorly or organizations get yelled at by their patients because there's a bunch of fiefdoms that patients have to navigate around. 
Why can't we bring more joy back in the workplace? First, we have to connect them back to the heart of why they got in. You worked in military treatment facilities. When we were at war, the mission was clear. Active duty come first, right? We had a mission. What's the mission when you're in peacetime? Like, la, 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 la. Depends on the leader that comes in that week. And so what we're trying to do is not only make an umbrella over the organization and say, where are we all going and how are we getting there? But then how do you localize that? So we create happiness in timeshare is by allowing you to own a piece of the magic. We're still creating happiness. We do that in central law, a laundry. We wash 60,000 costumes times three every day, the work, large work and water. We create happiness by keeping the magic squeaky clean, transportation. We keep, create happiness by keeping the magic rolling. Magic is the Disney product, if you will, not just happiness. You know, so I, I went to Lehigh Valley and, and did similar thing there. Lehigh Valley Health System in Allentown is, is all hospitals are not alike was their mission. I'm like, ooh, I don't really like that. But it forced an if-then statement, Mark. If all hospitals are not alike, then how is valet parking different? We create awesome arrivals and fond farewells. All right, that's a differentiator. In cardiology, we, all hospitals are not alike by being a beat above the rest. Oh, I get that beat. No, that's good. Yeah. A mother baby, we create new beginnings. Uh, the morgue, we create fond farewells. Um, everybody has to have a piece of that pie. If they don't, they make up their own information. What we learned in business school, Mark, is what gets measured gets done. And right. when you don't have clear information, chaos fills the void. So um, another one, another lesson I, I thought was interesting, and this is, I think, a trademark uh, phrase that, that you developed is uh, lessons 58 and 59. Talk about a concept you call the practice of caring out loud. Yeah. Um, uh, can you talk about that? What, is that? what does that phrase mean, caring out loud? It's great. It's narrating what you're doing before you do it. Narrating what you're doing while you do it and telling what the next step is. Uh, it really came from, uh, from two stories. Uh, my mom was a, 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 a nurse in a medical surgical unit and phlebotomy would come in and try to hit a vein of someone who's a tough stick. You usually get three shots and they kick you out of it. You're out of here. And you'd hear Barb poor paged over the head. Barb she has been doing this for 24 years. She knows what she's doing. She comes in. She does a little reconnaissance first. She's like, all right, tell me about the patient. Da, 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 da. Is, it, is it Dr. Bonica or is it Mr. Bonica? Is it Pastor Bonica? Rabbi? What's his name? Mark. Oh, just Mark? That's what he goes by? Does he have any kids? Do you have any dogs? Anything? What does he like to do? Ride bikes? Ride horses? What does he do? Oh, he's a doctor. He's in military treatment facility. Oh, great. Which one? Oh, in North Carolina? Okay. So she comes in and she connects with you on the human. And then she cares out loud. Mark, I'm so sorry that you were stuck three times. Obviously that person's a little new. We're a teaching facility, I'm so sorry. But listen, I've been doing this for 24 years and we have to get this blood every hour for the next four hours because it's a vital sign to let, us, let the doctors and I know whether you're getting better. So I'm so sorry. Hey, tell me about your family. And she, while she's caring out loud, she's getting you to care out loud. And then she'd tell you, great, now I'm gonna send this down to the lab and we're going to get some results. And she would tell you the next step in the process or the next person in the process. What rocket science. The other, the other story I'll tell you real quick is uh, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, we were going to the doctor. It's nine months now. My wife's like, woohoo, let's get this thing out of here. Pediatrician comes flying in the room. No knock, no hello. Papers literally flying in the shelf as he opened the door. Comes a nice guy, by the way. And he, he gets right to work, right? And he doesn't say hello, just straps a fetal monitor around my wife's abdomen. And he's saying, you know, how far along are you? And he's just verifying everything, date of birth and all that. And then his eyebrows raise. And he's, and he's obviously here's something that's not good. And my eyebrows raise. I look at my wife, her eyebrows are raised and something's wrong. And he writes something down. And then he unstraps a fetal monitor. He goes, yep, looks like you're all good. Call me when the water breaks. And he puts his hand on the doorknob, Mark which is a sign, a visual indication that I'm out of here. I got 38 other exam rooms, right? I'm gone. And I said, and he says, do you have any other questions? And I watch my wife tense up. My wife is, when she's not tense, she has a lot of questions. But I watched her tense up because she saw the hand on the doorknob and she froze. I go, you know what? I think my wife's got a lot of questions. Why don't you have a seat? And he goes, of course. And he sat down and I watched my, shoulder, my wife's shoulders go down. And then she said, what did you write down? He goes, Write down, oh, that wasn't nothing about you. I want to write myself a message of a last patient I saw. I just remembered it at that moment. He wasn't caring out loud. 
Yeah. And when he doesn't care out loud, chaos fills the void. We assume the word, we have the worry wart gene, especially when you're pregnant for the first time. Absolutely. Imagine how many touch points when a, when a food person comes in and lays a tray on a table that's not adjusted to the table and just leaves. Why didn't they do that? When a nurse comes in and, and starts speaking in IVs and DRGs and NICUs and PICUs and, and, and I, you know, acronyms, and you're NPO. Well, hallelujah. What the heck does that mean? Right? right. <laughs> and I took four years of Latin and I don't even remember what NPO stands for. Uh, so we have to make sure that we care out loud in a language that patients can understand. You have another, another lesson you call uh, lesson 95. Yeah. Uh, you talk about creating a culture of always, which I, I I've seen you use in a couple of places. So yeah. what does a culture of always mean in your practice? Well, uh, the consistency and constancy of walking your talk. Okay. So we have another tool called human business human. So, um, and we, we, we try to practice every phone call, every email, every meeting I conduct, I enter the room on the human. Good morning, everybody. Hello. That's human. Uh, how was your weekend? How was father's day? Uh, and they, 30 seconds later, they tell us a few stories. If I come in the meeting, or if I come into work and my assistant, Joanna, says, good morning, boss. How was your weekend? I say, get your, did you get that fax out to Banica on Friday? She'll put her hand on my doorknob. And she goes, I had a great weekend. Thanks for asking. My husband and I went to Cocoa Beach. We had a wonderful day. We, Sunday, we went to church picnic. My grandson hit a Grand Slam home run in Sapa. And then she'll stay. She'll say, and yeah, I got that fax out to Dr. Banica on Friday. And she'll slam the door. My culture of sometimes is the enemy of my culture of always. And what I'm trying to preach and pra build into the departmental playbooks in healthcare is how do we answer the phone? Now, if safety is being trumped, of course, that trumps everything. In the middle of a trauma or a STEMI or a code, right. not all bets are off still, but remove your hands from your husband, ma'am. I have to shock him back to life. Okay, I get that. But that's less than 1% of our cases. Right. Do we knock before entering a room or do we not? When we enter the room, do we shake hands like we used to, or do we fist bump because it's infection control? Do we introduce ourselves? Do we wear a name tag over our heart, or is it flipped over? What we're trying to create is a culture of always where we have consistency. Most physicians have no idea what their peers do behind closed doors. Yet patients do, because I see different five different providers that have my baby. I see the midwife, I see the D, I see the um, uh, OBGYN. You have three of them. And I see this other a nurse practitioner. What kind of consistency do we have? And what they say, you're all on different islands and you don't communicate very well. The hospitalist said, I can have a tray of food. You come in and say, I can't. And what their fear and anxiety, as Florence Nightingale said, is keeps rising. And we wonder why they don't sleep, they don't eat, and they stay longer than the DRG says. And we lose money, we don't make money. So there's a basic business value proposition is we've got to create a departmental playbook that's not just clinical pathway and operational excellence, but it mirrors the service excellence so that people know exactly what we expect here. And that's where there's a great uh, um, phrase that I learned in, in Disney's business school, which is unexpressed expectations can sometimes lead to unexpected resentments. I'm going to say that again. Unexpressed expectations, this is the way we do things here can sometimes lead to unexpected resentments. Well, you didn't tell me. That's the way I did it in my house. I call everybody by the first. I call everybody sugar, dude, sweetie, chief. What do you mean we don't do that here? So now we have a resentment because you didn't teach them on the outset that we don't say that here. And healthcare is full of that. We never say, I don't know. It's not my job or we're short staff. We never do. Unless literally in the middle of a code, where's Dr. So-and-so? Well, we're short staff today. He had to go down to the emergency department. That's an audible that you're allowed to do. But what about the standardization? And so that's an always playbook. That's a departmental play. Go to, Mark, go to any department in any hospital right now and ask for their standard operating procedure. Go to OBGYN, birthing center, right? It's 60 page, three inch notebook if they printed it out. And it's 60 page of photocopy pieces of paper that have been photocopied so many times over the last 10 years, you can't even read them anymore. And it's all clinical. How to do an epidural, how to do a C-section how to do infection control, how to do, do fight against uh, CLAPSI and MRSA. Nothing wrong with all that. Where's our quiet at night strategy? Where's our bedside manner? The things that patients are experts at are cleanliness, friendliness, and food. Right. Those are the three things they're experts at. And those are, they're going to, we got to get those three right. Well, it's so, like sorry. your grandmother can, you know, can yeah. evaluate those. She can't evaluate clinical quality, but she can evaluate, you know, is yeah. it clean? Yeah. 
Yeah, my grandmother said, I said, Grandma, how, how safe is a hospital? She goes, well, I only know how safe they are until safety has been jeopardized. Unless you're caring out loud, Mark, for your safety, Mr. Banika, can I see your wristband, please, to make sure it verifies my medicine I'm about to give you. For your safety and your privacy, folks, can I have you step, step out of dad's room while I, while I look at his bandages? For your safety, let me call down and do that. So if you're not caring out loud, safety is invisible to most patients. So when they get their survey and they just say, well, how's, how safe was the hospital? I don't know. Zero. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so you end the book with Lesson 99, which talks about developing an organizational true north. Now, I've, I've heard that phrase kind of tossed around in a couple of different places. What does it mean to you? And how do you teach that in your practice? Well, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. It, it connects people to purpose. Uh, in our organization, Dr. Wong and I sat down 18 years ago with Mark Bachman in that, that suite in the Hyatt Regency. And we said, how are we going to differentiate our consulting firm against all the other ones, Ritz-Carlton, even Disney Institute, which I started, and Studer Group, and all those other ones. And listen, there's a lot of organizations to do process improvement, organizational transformation, but we're going to elevate the human side of healthcare. That's going to be our difference. So at the end of the day, if I'm in a hospital and I walk over a piece of trash, people go, ah, uh -huh. or if I walk in a room and I don't introduce myself or I don't have a name tag on, they point back to you don't even walk your own talk. That's on your own business card. It's on your own name tag. The further away we are from the patient experience, the harder this is to connect people back to purpose. Every meeting should have an agenda at the top with our mission on it. What is the mission critical in this organization? I have in front of me a wristband that I wear, the only organization I've worked with over the 18 years that pretty much solidifies it. It's Dignity Health. We unite healing and human kindness. We unite healing, clinical excellence, with human kindness. Why do we do that? It's a great peace of mind for every person, every time through a culture. Yes, it's theirs. It's uniquely theirs, Sacramento, California, and it only works there. It's not going to work if I drop it in Dallas, Texas, or Bay State Health up in Springfield, Massachusetts, or Florida Hospital Adventist in Orlando. Yeah. You've got to take your mission, your vision, and your values and put them in a blender and come out with three to five words that unite you. doesn't matter where you work. And it can't be just clinical. And it can't just be operational. It's got to be the people in the hinterlands. Uh, what they call themselves the redheaded stepchild. If you don't connect people to purpose, then they're just going to be doing their job test. If they're just doing their job test every Sunday afternoon, they're going to open up the want ads and look for somebody who's going to pay them a little bit more closer to home. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you got to start there. The heart leads the head, then leads the hands. It's always got to be in that order. So we've been talking a lot about patient experience. Um, you know, I, 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 I've seen the establishment now of chief patient experience officers, vice presidents of patient experiences. My observation, it's a relatively new thing. Of course, I'm coming out of the military system, so maybe it's been around longer than I think. I mean, my personal experience, I, I you know, was, uh, you know, my, one of the first things I was asked to do as a brand new second lieutenant, you know, a couple of months into the job was to teach a customer service class. Like, what did I I'm going to tell, I mean, but what that says, that says less about me because I didn't know anything about it. You know, I was just told to do it, uh, but that the organization didn't really value it, right? If, if they valued it, they wouldn't have asked the brand new, you know, guy who doesn't know anything. Um, so a lot's changed uh, since then. And I, don't, and I don't think the Army would do that anymore either. Uh, I think they've gotten on board with this to some degree. But why is it that this is such a hard thing, right? Like, why is it that we have to have, I mean, why is it we have to have a chief patient experience officer, or, or, or maybe you don't think we do, like, but, but I mean, but why is this a thing that we we're, seem like we've just, dis like healthcare has just discovered, oh, you know, patient experience kind of, that's important. Man, we got 200 years of culture to change. <laughs> okay. uh, and military treatment facilities, you know, you've got well over 200 years of, of healthcare to change. Um, my short answer, let me take you back to Disney for a moment. Uh, so we're launching Disney MGM Movie Studios. Um, uh, I think they call it Hollywood Studios now since I've been gone. And by the way, if you've been to Disney in the last 18 years and you loved it, I helped build it. But if you've been there in the 18 years and you hated it, it's because I left. Okay, just as my, <laughs> my little token. Um, when we opened the Disney MGM Studios, we opened a guest relations department as an information center. And there was a conversation in 1989 Shouldn't everybody do service recovery? Why does, when somebody have a complaint, why do they come to our department? Why shouldn't it be everybody's role? 
at first in 1971, when we, we first launched the, the Disney product from 1955 in California, moved it to Florida, the complaint department had to be a specialized service. It had to be somebody's job because not everybody was acclimated or armed with the right tools to make that so. That's my juxtaposition for you in who should own the patient experience. Here's a big, huge, gaping problem, and I hate to scare your students and the people listening for this, but let me give you a reality check, and I don't want to discourage you from getting the healthcare. It's my mission. It's my calling, and we need disciples. We need your help, but here's a reality. We have scheduled to the breaking point, and I'm talking about every level. The front desk person used to be three FTEs. Now it's one full-time equivalent. And she's checking people in. She's doing insurance verification. She's trying to check people out. And she gets yelled at by MAs and physicians because there's delays. And all three of those. You go to a courtyard Marriott and you check in, as I do pretty much five days a week, and they're only checking me in. They're not doing wake-up calls. They're not doing credit card and uh, verification. There's people in the back that are doing that. But the person at the front desk is not even a front desk anymore. It's two kiosks. They come out in front of the kiosk. They shake my hand. Good morning. Hello. Welcome. Can I help you out? My name is Mr. Poor. And then they said the words, we've been expecting you. I know it's scripted, but I still like it. But we have no clue. We don't want to say we're expecting you, even though we are scheduled for that mammogram. We're like, next. And it's at best, the Department of Motor Vehicles, at worst, adding more fear and anxiety. Why should there be somebody whose sole role is chief experience officer? Because everybody else has skin in the game somewhere else. If you're also the chief nursing officer and are also passionate about marketing, my mom had four titles. Her voicemail was like four hours long. I was bar poor, chief nurse, head of med surge, interim nurse manager of oncology, hematology, leave a guard. What? Now you don't even have any time left on the voicemail. That's healthcare, folks. We have scheduled you to the, and by the way, the PETA principle doesn't really apply here. We just overload you. If you are so good running one clinic, we're going to give you five. If you can handle five next year, we're going to give you nine. We're going to promote you to your level of incompetence by just giving you way too much bandwidth than you can handle. So who should run the patient experience? Of course, everybody should run the patient experience, but somebody has to own it, lead it, and hold people accountable to it. Now, eventually, just like complaint management at Disney is everybody's role, at one point, it had to be a departmental role, and it had to tear up to Tracy Donaldson at Disney and Jim Studios, and the buck stops here. And somebody has to aggregate the data, mine the data, go back to the data and say, hey, you taking pictures over in Toonland, you contract, we're changing your contract. You need to go through new employee orientation. Your people need to be retrained because you're not just taking pictures here. You're creating happiness or you're not. Now that's accountability. And in healthcare, if somebody doesn't own it and everybody owns it, it's like the morass of what's more important, Mark? Quality, safety, patient experience, or productivity? Right. Yeah. They're all equally important. Right. Right. Which right. ball can you drop? You can't drop any of them. Well, if they're all equally important, then none of them are important. So my advocacy in 2019 in June is find somebody, and it can't be, do not give me the head of the complaint department, patient relations, and just change her title. Because all she's going to be doing 89% of the day is complaint management. It has to be someone who's separate and reports directly to the CEO. It has to be that important. Okay. So you're a fan of that high level kind of uh, setting that, setting that, creating that position. At the outset, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, let me, uh, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask about leadership. And so um, do you have, so you're, so you're both a leadership kind of leadership consultant, um, you know, but you're also, um, or I think of what you do is, is, as shaping leadership. So you're both a leadership consultant, but you're also, uh, you know, you also run your own business. Yep. So, do you have an articulated leadership philosophy that you abide by or try to live up to? Um, I have, I have, I have one that I try to live internally. It's our logo. Our logo has a compass and inside the compass is the yin and the yang, um, black or white, hot or cold. Right. But the yin and the yang for us, Dr. Wong brought to us is how you treat your employees will mirror how they treat the patient. So in my company, I don't always do it, but I put myself out there. 
And I said, if I'm not treating you the way I expect you to treat our clients, our customers, or healthcare institutions, then I want you to call me on it. So when I skip the human, <laughs> I get emails back, good morning, boss, human in parentheses. The answer to your question is blank, business. Have a great day, Jake, human, and then, you know, some off-color okay. comment like jackass or something. <laughs> uh, but my mantra, if you hear me speak in a keynote or if I come to your hospital or your educational academic medical center or university is in 2019 top down doesn't work anymore it just doesn't work you can have the greatest playbook in the world but a leader in healthcare today i don't care if you're a junior leader if you've been there 22 years is ask don't tell give them a nebulous concept like my my tool human business human human clinical human folks we're going to start on the human we're going to take care of our business we're gonna, we're going to do it every time tell me what that lock looks like in your area and a flip, phlebotomist will raise her hand. Well, if I skip the human the, and I come in and I say, which arm? They usually tense up and it's hard to hit the vein. Great. So what I do is I connect with them and say, oh, I understand you're, you like to go by Mark. I understand you have two dogs. I understand you, your kid's going away to camp for the first time. And I distract them and I get my business done. If I don't distract, oh, great. What does that look like in Valet Park? Oh, I, I don't. I used to open the door and say, park your car, skip the human. And now I say, welcome to St. Luke's. My name is Jake, how can I help you? And they usually say something like, can you get my grandmother a wheelchair? So I found that skipping to my business made us a less human organization. Also, I enjoy my job more. Yeah. Asking as a leader, don't tell, is a mantra that I try to live by that has made me a better trainer or consultant too because every time you tell me how you've adapted and adopted it, I get to use that with my next client. I'm like a bumblebee. I take all this pollen, I get to take it to the next organizations. There's 4,600 hospitals that need this stuff. So that would be my philosophy and my mantra. You get to see a lot of leaders out in the field. I mean, you work in a lot of different organizations. What makes a really good leader? What makes a, 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 a particularly effective leader? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think off the top of my head, a great leader is humble enough to know they don't know it all. I think someone who is a lifelong learner, who is constantly watching TED Talks, um, going to conferences, gleaning best practices, keeping those best practices and lessons learned in their hip pocket, and they go back to their organization and ask questions to see if the employees will glean the same outcome they have in their hip pocket. I think a great leader is a mentor, someone the higher they, at, at any level, I don't care if you're in a residency program or a fellowship, they're always reaching back and sharing best practices and lessons learned with those who are hungry for it too. We've all been there, Mark, right? Balloon seller making $3.81 an hour to an executive making six figures uh, at Disney. We, we have to grow our own or otherwise we're only as, as good as, as, as our you know, lowest frontline employees. We need to treat employees exactly how we want them to treat our customers. So. To me, those are the attributes of a, of a great leader. We've just got a minute left. So let me, uh, as you know, I teach here up at, at the University of New Hampshire, and I teach uh, mostly undergraduates who are looking at health administration. What advice do you have to them entering the field? What, what um, uh, you know, given all, all the time you've spent in all these different organizations, what is exciting about the field that you see, and what should they be looking to do? Well, if you got anything out of this call, there's a huge hunger for explicitness and specific cultures of intention in healthcare. Uh, when mother, the mother of invention is necessity, there's a huge need for you in healthcare. If you're the person who wants to get their education, get their street smarts and the experience, but you're also a passionate person who has applicable stories to tell, we need you. My advice to you is the same advice my father gave me when I got on that plane the second time they went back to Disney and he said, see you later. We are never going to see you again. I'm like, what are you talking about? I put a year in, five years in. Now, this is a paratrooper in World War II who was in the Band of Brothers. And he, his Jeep hit a landmine in Germany and he woke up in England blind for six months until he got his sight back. And he says, you know what I'm going to tell you in 40 years of working in CBS television, Jake? If it's meant to be, it has to start with me. So. Just because you have a pedigree of a, of a BA or a master's or a PhD, good. But great leaders know the way 
then they go the way before they can show the way. So if it's meant to be leaders, you have to start by example. And I don't care what level you are in the organization. You could be a volunteer candy striper. You could be a volunteer at the front desk. You could be down sterile processing. We all have a circle of influence. If you're a lifelong learner, if you're hungry to make a difference, then we need you in healthcare. But be ready to roll up your sleeves and never say it's not my job. Never say I don't do that. I didn't go to nursing school for that. Uh, that's below my license. Those words have got it. You got to model it. And I think in that servant leadership, you'll go far in this organization. And, it, and we're all going to have bad organizations and we're going to have bad leaders. But there's a whole lot of hospitals you can choose from. No, I welcome you. I think of all the industries with the greatest opportunity for change, we need people like you. So, uh, Jake, um, thanks for the time, your time today. Let me, uh, 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 if folks want to find out more about you or they want to find out more about integrated loyalty systems, uh, where can they find you on the web? Well, um, yeah, my website is wecreateloyalty.com. It's all one word. We create loyalty.com. Dr. Wong, my founding partner, said, Satisfaction, that's fool's goal. He doesn't really sound like that, but that's my best Dr. Wong impression. So okay. we gotta we gotta focus on loyalty. So that's why we created a company called Integrated Loyalty Systems. But our website is we create loyalty.com. I think everything you'll find there, I'm totally transparent. You'll follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Yelp. Uh, I'm all out there. And by the way, uh, if you want to reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, link in with me. I'm, I'm constantly sharing these tools, these anecdotes, and these videos. Soon we'll take those 99 lessons uh, and we'll create little video vignettes of examples. And I'm going to create a whole separate division of our website just for that book. So you can see a variety of examples, good, bad, and ugly. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you. And I hope, uh, hope your team and your students make a difference. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community and we'll talk with you again soon.